My name is Lady Izdahar and I'm a historian on Eastern Europe and former Soviet states. Today I want to talk about full costumes, what they are, why you would want to wear them, and how incorporating folk style can really help you reconnect with your past. Vaguely speaking, as Wikipedia describes it, a wonderful source, a folk costume expresses an identity through costume which is usually associated with a geographic area or a period of time in history. It can also indicate social, marital, and religious status. For some of us, it's not so easy to pick one location or one folk costume style to inspire us. Many of us live in the diaspora, disconnected from our cultural background, especially those of us in the US, where we might be generations away from those who came from wherever they came from. <laughs> There's this unfortunate reality that for the sake of ease of life, many of our ancestors and family, when they came to the US, completely let go of their folk traditions and folk way of dressing. It was what they had to do. And it can leave us today feeling a bit lost and disconnected from any sort of culture. And for me, I found so much happiness and contentness, um, and as a historian, just satisfaction in learning the, my own past through incorporating different folk aspects into my everyday dress. For instance, I am a Muslim, I converted to Islam in 2014, wearing the style of headdress that dominantly Arab women wear didn't feel very me. So about a year and a half ago, I started dressing in a way, covering my head in a way that I could personally connect to. I started wearing these folk scarves that are common throughout Eastern Europe. And since then, I've never looked back and have only incorporated more and more things from that part of the world into my everyday life. And I highly, highly recommend everyone doing this. Figuring out where your boundaries are and what you want to incorporate is very importance. Um, you don't really want to wear Japanese traditional dress if you have no connection to that part of the world, if you're not ethnically from there, if your family never lived there, if it doesn't have a connection then I don't see the reason why you would incorporate that. However, using my own background, most of my family are Danub Swabians who lived in different villages in Serbia and Romania for hundreds of years. So I take inspiration from not only Germanic minority groups in Eastern Europe, but also from traditional uh, Serbian, Romanian, and surrounding Eastern Europe areas for inspiration. My husband is from Russia. Um, and my area of study is in Eastern Europe, Russia, and Eurasia. And so I take a lot of inspiration from all of these areas that I have a personal connection to and I want to learn more about by embracing certain aspects of their way of dressing or traditions. Now this doesn't mean I copy and paste what things look like. Uh, one that is disingenuous because I did not grow up there, I'm not 100% from these places, even those I have traced ancestry to. And I think it's important to remember that folk costumes weren't stagnant and didn't look one way. Not only did they change from city to city, people to people, family to family, but when these people groups moved somewhere, what their costumes looked like changed as well, depending on their surroundings, the climate, the kinds of access they had to fabric. Uh, we really view what folk costumes are in a very stagnant and narrow-minded way. Again, take the Danube Swabians, for example. None of them really remain <laughs> in the former Banat of Serbia and Romania. Some do, but not in the same way that they used to exist there. And those who moved to the US primarily moved to the Dakotas and they started to blend in with other Germanic ethnic groups that also moved to America. And so today, a lot of them don't wear the same folk costumes they did in the Banat. They have adapted a more unified German dirndl look, even though that's not historically what they wear. This is just a really good example of how Traditional identifiers, traditional dress can change depending on what you have access to. It's very hard to uh, recreate and obtain traditional Danube Swabian dress from the Banat. Uh, and also it's just a lot easier to merge into the common Germanic culture that already exists in a, lo in a location. So when you're going to apply that to yourself, uh, let's say you don't even live in the same biome <laughs> that you're family is from, it wouldn't make sense for someone who lives in the desert to wear a wool traditional costume all the time or a piece of a traditional dress that is wool. 
you also, you know, you need to decide why are you doing this? Do you want to connect with your past? Is it meaningful for you? Is it purely for aesthetic? It's important to know that no matter what you do, people are going to disagree with you. There's going to be people who will say, if you're not doing things 100% historically accurate or 100% culturally accurate, then don't do it at all. And there's people who will be mad when you do do it 100% historically accurate and culturally accurate because they think it's disingenuous or you didn't grow up here. For me, connecting to my background with historical dress and traditional dress has helped me learn about where I'm from. And as someone who's very used to being an outsider in many different societies and communities, I am very familiar with the fact that lots of people will never accept me. There are people who live in Romania and Serbia who will never, ever, ever see me as one of them, right? This is just a fact of life. Something that has helped me through that is education. Maybe I'll never be accepted, but if I am the person who knows everything, if I'm the person who understands why they do what they do, what they wear, exactly why they wear it, uh, how that came to be, the you know military history of the region, if I know all of the things and at the end of the day they still have to come to me to understand their own history, that's a win. That's a very selfish way to look at things, but it's something that has helped me. And so I really want you to, if you're thinking about dressing in this way, incorporating your past, incorporating your old traditions that were lost, just know that lots of people will absolutely despise you for it, just as anything in life. People won't agree with you, and they don't have to. But I think it's important for you to solidify your reasons for why you want to do this. And I think connecting to your past that is lost, especially in the West, is extremely important because a lot of us feel very, very lost these days, and we have become a part of this broader American culture that doesn't really exist, which is void of things, which is almost fascist in nature and how void of uh, elements it is and how much it erases our beautiful backgrounds. Like I said, I take a lot of different elements from Eastern Europe and Russia to create something that I fully connect with. A way that you can think about that is, as I mentioned, folk costumes weren't stagnant. They were always changing. When new fabrics were coming out, new prints, you know, especially at the very, very early stages of the Industrial Revolution, where there were more and more factories creating fabrics, um, the folk dress was going through rapid, rapid changes. People did start um, taking in inspiration from the city folk, even though a lot of the movements to implement folk costumes were inherently anti-industrialization and anti-city. Um, there was an obvious effect on what the folk costume looked like through that rapid change, not just during the Industrial Revolution, but beforehand as new pigments became easier to use, um, as people moved to different locations. It was just ever changing. And so I think we need to remember this when we're thinking about what I want to wear, what my people wore, because it's going to change on the era and even within these eras, it was changing uh, rapidly with inspiration, location, dyes, and so on. What you wear doesn't have to be an actual folk costume. For instance, me wearing a scarf like this automatically makes anything look a bit more from my people. This blouse I'm wearing is probably made through slave labor as it was bought from a fast fashion company. And this vest I'm wearing is actually from a Slovak or Rusin Kroy. It's not 100% certain, but it was a Kroy made in the diaspora, made in the US. Uh, with untraditional fabrics in the style of a Slovak or Rusin Kroy, and I had to have it for my own research studies and to implement in my own dress. Um, and you know, pairing things like this auto automatically make you look more folky, but it's also not accurate, and that's okay because it gives off the vibe that you're going for. It is reminiscent of what these people wore, it is reminiscent of what your ancestors and family wore, and it helps you feel close to them. On top of this, I also have this wonderful skirt. Now this is actually a skirt from the 60s. Um, it has nothing to do with folk costumes, it was by a company in California. I saw this for sale on Etsy, and uh, I noticed that the trim, despite it being like a picnic skirt from California, the trim was very, very reminiscent of Moldovan and Ukrainian ribbon. And so I had to get it. And altogether, this makes something that 
definitely reads Eastern European folk costume, but it's also from my own resourced local <laughs> uh, places. Like I got it from Etsy, I got it from thrift stores. You know, I got this from an old Ukrainian lady who passed away and had many folk scarves left over. This is what I mean when it comes to regional sourcing. You don't have to buy, like I don't have to go and buy uh, a folk costume 100% from Romania to feel as though I'm connected to the land that my family once was at. It can be achieved in many different ways and I think this is important to remember. And you can make costumes if that's something that you're able to do and want to do. Now the only full folk costume that I own, like I said, is that Croy made in the diaspora. Um, and I never wear it fully together. One, I'm not Slovak or Rusin, but there's elements of these costumes that are similar to Germanic minority groups in Eastern Europe, to Eastern Europe in general, um, to where all my inspiration and influence is pulled from. So this is the top from the Croix. <laughs> uh, it's very, very detailed. Um, I don't often wear this, mostly because of the sleeves, because I am a Muslim. I do uh, adhere to certain standards of personal modesty, which means I usually don't like my elbow showing, but sometimes if it's hot enough, I will wear this. It's just... It, I don't get as much wear out of this as I do the other items, is what I'm saying. But I love to learn about the garments from this, and I love having different pieces to implement in my everyday life to help me feel connected to the lands that my ancestors are from. Um, underneath this is the skirt, which as you can see, uh, matches this. Yeah, this is a Polish top. This is a uh, folk embroidered top from the 80s from Poland. Again, just based off of the embroidery, having similar styles uh, throughout Eastern Europe, and a white blouse that can pair with absolutely any kind of skirt ever and automatically have a folk-inspired look to it. I am not Polish, but the types of embroidery that are common in Poland are common throughout Eastern Europe and Slavic nations. And so I feel like having pieces like this are a really, really good find. And this was very, very cheap. Um, I highly recommend looking for folk inspired items from the 70s and 80s and also handmade items. And I will get to that in a second. The next item I have to show you is a calico maxi skirt. And this is a really important thing to note that calico was very popular all throughout Europe. In Russia and Eastern Europe, you see a lot of women adapting skirts like this in the early 1900s, late 1800s. Um, particularly, you see a lot of Cossack women wearing skirts like this, um, but this is also something that was popular in colonial America as well. Um, if you want to dress like someone who steals land, this might be for you. <laughs> I'm really selling it. Uh, but I personally got it because it's very reminiscent of a lot of Cossack costumes that I see. Um, you know, a lot of festivals where you see sword dancing, you see women wearing skirts like this, showing off their wondrous arts of the Cossack sword. So yeah, that's basically why I got this. Because it is so multi cultural, it's very international. Calico was all over the place in many people's history. Um, finding calico skirts and calico dresses like this is also always a really good bet, especially if you have a very mixed ancestry or you don't really know what part of your heritage you want to focus on. Jewelry is also something that can really help you connect to the past. When we talk about folk costumes, I know we mostly focus on the fabrics, but there's different elements that we can have um, in our everyday, maybe more casual outfits that are uplifted through uh, proper, I suppose, historically uh, inspired, folk inspired jewelry. I have this bracelet, which is in a Ottoman style, but it shows um, a couple dancing lezginka, which is the traditional dance of where my husband is from. Also being, us both being Muslims, we like to learn about Ottoman history, uh, there's a lot of Ottoman influence in the Balkans, where my family is from. Uh, and so this is like a really fun item that incorporates both my husband's background and my own. And so I love wearing this little Lezginka Ottoman bracelet. Ultimately, it's all personal. It's all personal choices. It's all dependent on your past, where you put your boundaries on your inspiration, 
Um, the more you learn about your family, the more you learn about the history of the regions that you are from, um, it, it's all up to you what you want to implement and what you don't want to implement. Maybe you want to wear an entire folk costume because 100% of your family is for sure from a place and you have no shame in showing everyone that all the time. That's great. There's practicality in folk costumes. A lot of people look at it and say, oh, aren't you hot in that? As a Muslim, <laughs> I can tell you. No, we're not often super hot being fully covered and your ancestors who are usually most likely, probably fully covered as well, are not hot either. I think understanding our past, understanding our history is something extremely important. How you got where you are, why your family is the way it is, sometimes understanding your own struggles and mental state can be totally based on your family's history and how they ended up where they are. For me, I began studying history in Eastern Europe and Russia and all of this because of my own ancestry, because my family didn't have a lot of information where we were from. We have one book of our family history and those who moved here immediately moved on from the past and so much was lost. And so I spent the majority of my life learning about the region that my family is from. And that's what started my interest in history and this enormous change in my life. As I grew older, being more connected to a history that was completely lost, especially the more that I became well versed in the history of the regions and the people and how misunderstood it was, I realized I was not who I wanted to be. I was misunderstanding myself and that I needed to do some reconnecting with my past that was lost. And I think a lot of people, especially those in the US and in the UK, can relate to feeling a sense of something missing because of their ancestors moving on. It's not, you don't have to blame them. It's not necessarily a bad thing. They did what they had to do. The thing is, it doesn't have to stay that way. We can reclaim our past and we can learn about it and we can embrace it in a way that is physical. As I mentioned, I'm a convert to Islam and finding a style that worked for me when I decided eventually, years after converting, that I wanted to be more uh, modest in how I dressed and perhaps more identifiable as a Muslim, although I don't think people think I'm Muslim when they see me because I dress so uh, Eastern European. <laughs> uh, though, uh, uh, as a widely misunderstood place, there are plenty of ethnic Muslim groups in the region, hence the Ottoman history, uh, among other reasons, like the Golden Horde. Finding a self-expression self that felt right for me as a historian, uh, as a lover of the past, as someone with ancestry in the region that I study, and then eventually someone who was, became even more connected to Russian and the history, the history of the Caucasus through my husband, I just couldn't postpone not, I couldn't postpone embracing anything any longer, even if it meant people would feel weird because I'm dressed crazy in public. Actually, that's never been a problem. I'm from a family of alternative punk rock people and I've been five foot ten since I was 12 years old so I've always stood out but that doesn't matter what I'm saying is that I didn't feel like me especially as I got older and there was more and more pressure to dress more professionally if my profession is in teaching and studying history then I should look like what I'm studying is what I think especially if I have a personal connection to it and so over this past year I've started to embrace that and as I mentioned as a Muslim finding a way to cover that is more ingrained in my own family is incredible. Uh, if any of you are interested in covering your heads, it doesn't have to be for a religious reason, um, just in general, especially uh, peasants and those who did a lot of hard labor, they wore head scarves and head coverings just to keep their head out of their face every day. But it exists in just about every single culture. And so a lot of people ask me, I'm not Muslim, I'm not religious, can I wear a headscarf? Absolutely, especially if it is connected to your own family background, which I guarantee there is a form of it that is. I'm getting so off topic, aren't I? My point is, from a personal perspective, this has helped me tremendously in my professional life, in my personal life, in my self-understanding, in my appreciation for the past and history. And I hope by doing this living history research in a way, uh, a remake of it because it's not copy and paste, we live in a different time, in different places more often, and with 
less or limited or different resources than what our ancestors did. So the way that it's going to look isn't going to be exact and it shouldn't be because that's not how folk costumes work. As I said, they were not stagnant. They were fluid. That's the word. They were fluid. And the way we view what our ancestors wore isn't often viewed in the fluidity that it had. And I think that's important. And I think we can embody that with using what we have resources for and towards and in the way that we change it up based on where we are. Studying the past and embracing the past in this physical way, as I mentioned, also brings unwanted attention. And you might be accused of things. A lot of people associate uh, dressing in a way that is covered or dressing in a way that is uh, folk inspired as almost nationalist. There's a lot of negative nationalist movements that have used folk costumes uh, in a way to promote their ideology. I know lots of friends of mine who also dress this way have been called trad wives, as in traditional wife. Um, a interesting term to describe a very stereotypical wife who stays at home, does the housework, all that kind of jazz. Not that there's anything wrong with that if that's what you want in your life, but it definitely is not my situation. <laughs> People will always assume things. People assume that I must hate, I don't know, equality and the LGBT community and, I don't know, puppies because of the way that I dress and that's not true at all because while it does represent something from my ancestry, it certainly does not represent my ideology and clothing doesn't have to represent ideologies. <laughs> uh, I think that should be very clear. But because folk costume has such a mm, connection to anti-industrial movements, to the romance movement specifically, which was heavily <laughs> influential in creating a uh, nationalist tension, uh, unfortunately you're going to come across people who think of that and associate it with that. And the best advice I can give anyone with my own life experience, with the fact that I don't fit in anywhere, is to just not care. Easier said than done. But if you're choosing something for you, if you're connecting to the past and wearing clothes like this for you and your own understanding, then other people shouldn't be involved in that equation. And it really doesn't matter what they think. Because of the pandemic, I think a lot of people have realized uh, that the way that they were dressing was not how they wanted to dress. It was more based on societal expectations, which are also completely made up. I mean, full costumes and designs are also made up, but they're made up with uh, better reasons and a longer standing history than modern takes on uh, socially acceptable attire. A lot of that influenced by minimalism, which is influenced by fascism, which is an absence of our cultures and diversity as well. So think of that. For living in such an individualist society, we tend to really hate when people are actually individualists. We try to take away their cultures, take away their differences, take away their inspiration of dress. Uh, it's quite, quite ironic. But yeah, it's for you. And more and more people are expressing themselves in a more authentic way, having to be isolated and alone and reassessing what's important in life. We see a huge movement, similar to the romance movement, as I mentioned before, of people wanting to live more simply, reconnecting with the earth, reconnecting with their past, uh, by connecting through folk costumes and the practicality that a lot of them had in everyday living uh, in a simple way we can really see how far we have gone away from something that there is nothing inherently wrong with. But no matter what you choose to do, truly it needs to be from pure intention, from your own genuine interest, and with the attitude of other people's opinion doesn't care. No, other people's opinion do not matter. Hi, I speak English, I promise. And an understanding that people will disagree with you from every perspective. You will be misunderstood. You will be assumed and associated with things you have nothing to do with. <laughs> people will be upset with you. People will do all sorts of things. That's anything in life. But when you stick out even more so, just understand that it serves a bigger purpose and understanding yourself, your past, reconnecting with history and doing what you want to do 
is a lot more important than what people think and I just can't emphasize that enough because I know so many people the only reason they don't take this step to wear what they want and to reconnect with their past and wear folk costumes if they want to is because they're terrified of the reception they're afraid that people will judge them and they will 100% but it does not matter and you cannot live your life afraid of what other people think that is no way to live if you want to live simply if you want to live in connection with your past, you cannot be deterred by those things. And I really, really encourage you, please, be inspired by history. Everything is the way it is today because of the past, and we must understand that. And there's so many steps and ways to understand that past and to create a future. This is a small way that I choose to do that, for selfish reasons and for larger reasons. I am inspired by history. I want you to be inspired by history. If you want to wear a full costume, go ahead. Do it. Yeah, I don't know. I hope this, you know, I wish this was a lot more structured. Uh, my brain doesn't really work that way. <laughs> I was hoping it'd be like, oh, step one, step two, why you should wear. Hopefully you got the gist of that. Um, so if you want to know why, you might want to, why you should, why it is okay to wear folk costumes. I hope this gave you a really good uh, beginning conceptual thought, beginning process. Wow, great with words is the heart. I hope this helped, so thank you for being here. I appreciate it. Check me out on Instagram and support me on Patreon if you are one of the lucky few in the US that has money to do so. Okay. Bye.